Don't do that to me right before I have to talk. <laughs> Turn around is fair play, right? So the song, of course, could not be more perfect for today, for this month, since we are using Reverend Sandy's book there as our theme, as our reference for this month's work. <sighs> Hold on, I'm, I'm going to do it in just one second. <laughs> that got me. Opening hearts and incubating dreams. That's our theme. That is the reason Creative Living Fellowship has been around for the last 20, by the way, this year, 20 years, to open hearts and incubate dreams. That's why we're here. That's who we are. This month, using Reverend Sandy's book, we are looking at how do we bridge the gap, which Reverend Sandy defines in her book as the grand adventure and purpose. How do we bridge the gap between the incubation meaning the idea, the seedling of a thought, an insp- a, a divinely inspired idea, a God-given dream, how do we take that seed and actually move it into manifestation? There is a process. And between the seed and the manifestation, there can be some midair. <laughs> midair. And we're looking this month about how we bridge that midair gap. How do we do it? And Reverend Sandy's book is filled with her story and then spiritual tools that she used to help her bridge a significant uh, gap. And the line in the song, which I really encourage you to read Sandy's book if you don't know her story, the line in the song where Cerise said, I had to leave, I'm paraphrasing now, but I had to leave or I would die, that is not a metaphor. That is physical reality. She had to make a change or she would have died. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you want to know that story, pick up her book. And I'm sure she'd be happy to sign it for you after service, right? (laughs) We have it in the bookstore. It's on sale this month. So please uh, get that great book and support Sandy's dream as well. So that's what we're doing this whole month is looking at tools to help us walk across the bridge. And I've said to build the bridge as we're walking across it, but it really isn't to build the bridge because the bridge is already there. It's to help us see the bridge that is already there. It is already there. Just like last week I gave the example of the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, or Lost Crusade or whatever that movie's called, where he's you know standing at the edge of the precipice and the, his dream, his divinely inspired idea, his divinely inspired aspiration is on the other side. It's the Holy Grail and he's got to step off that ledge. But what he finds out is when he steps off, there is actually a bridge there. He just couldn't see it. So that's what we're doing last week. Today and next week, we're looking at tools to help us reveal the bridge, at least two steps in front of us. We had one of our, wasn't a founding board member, but one of a a board member in in the early days of CLF, when we were really just trying to figure out what the heck we were doing and creating things as we went along. He said, you know, it feels like we're always building the bridge two steps in front of uh, walking over it. And I said, you know, that's absolutely right. That's what we're doing. And life is like that. We're building the bridge just a couple of steps before we walk it. But the truth is we're not building it really. We're simply revealing it. So as I said, because last Sunday, today, and next Sunday are all about tools to build, to reveal that bridge, I thought a good bridge would be to start today with the way I ended last week. So I ended last week by sharing with you a brief passage from um, a different book, not Reverend Sandy's book, but another book called The Alchemist, A Fable About Following Your Dream. The Alchemist was written in the 80s. Uh, It was written by a Brazilian author translated into English in the 90s. And I heard from someone in first service that you can actually go up on YouTube and you can listen to the entire book. It's not a very long book. It is a beautiful book. I want to go do that. I'd love to hear it. How many have read Alchemist or heard of it? Oh, a good number of you, but a lot not. It's an incredible story of a little shepherd boy who has a big dream that he doesn't think he can accomplish, but he decides to follow the guidance, the dream anyway, that incubated dream. He decides to do his best to pursue that dream. 
And in the passage that I shared with you last week, he has finally met the alchemist who he'd been looking for. Uh, the alchemist, the man who can turn metal into gold, he thought, the young boy thought, surely this alchemist will give him some guidance and some help in reaching his goal. Because at that point he was discouraged. He was thinking he wasn't going to make it. There was too many challenges. He wasn't going to make it. So he's having in this passage that I shared this last week a conversation with the alchemist. So that's where we're going to start our time this morning. My heart is afraid it will have to suffer, the boy told the alchemist one night as they looked up to the moonless sky. Tell your heart that the fear of suffering is worse than suffering itself and that no heart has ever suffered when it goes in search of its dreams because every second of the search is a second's encounter with God and with eternity. Every second of the search is an encounter with God, the young boy told his heart. When I have been truly searching for my treasure, every day has been luminous because I've known that every hour was a part of the dream that I would find. When I have been truly searching for my treasure, I've discovered things along the way that I never would have seen had I not had the courage to try things that seemed impossible for a shepherd to achieve. And that's how we ended last Sunday. <clears throat> I want to read a bit more of the story to take us now into today. And I'm going to pick up exactly where that left off. And when I was sharing with Lonnie this week about this idea, uh, he said, you know, I think maybe you've got to provide milk and cookies because this is going to be story time. So uh, I thought about providing milk and cookies, but then I thought, you know, what happens after story time and milk and cookies for people? <laughs> nap time and I don't want anybody falling asleep so we're not doing milk and cookies however unless first service ate them all and there were a few people in first service so that might have happened but unless that happened there are lots of cookies in the homes hall for after service we had an amazing wedding here last night member Casey Roberts got married and um, it was all green a green theme which is why and we have these lovely flowers left over and um, they had green cookies and candy and uh, cupcakes we had a lot, and they left a lot because they had a lot left over. So you can probably get some cookies after service. I don't know about the milk part, but you can at least get cookies in there. Not right now. But I want to continue this story. So this is story time. There are two, two times today that it's going to be story time. This is the first one. So I'm going to end, um, I'm going to begin with the last sentence that I just ended with. I've discovered things along the way that I never would have seen had I not had the courage, this is the young shepherd talking, to try things that seemed impossible for a shepherd to achieve. So his heart was quiet for an entire afternoon. That night the boy slept deeply and when he awoke he heard his heart began to tell him things that came from the soul of the world. His heart began to tell him things that came from the soul of the world. If you were here last week, what is that referring to? The voice that loves me. The voice that Reverend Sandy says. That's the voice that loves me, which is what? Our what? Intuition. Our intuition, our inner voice, our inner guidance. It's the voice. That's exactly what that is. So that night, the boy slept deeply, and when he awoke, his heart began to tell him things that came from the soul of the world. It said that all people who are happy have God within them. Now, I'm going to just have to just adjust that a smidge. Just a smidge. This is how I would write that line. It said that all people who are happy know that they have God within them. Because we all have God within us, we just don't know it. And it's the knowing of it that brings the happiness. All right, now I'll quit editing and I'll continue. And that happiness can be found in even a grain of sand from the desert. Because a grain of sand is a moment of creation. Everyone on earth has a treasure that awaits him, his heart said. We, people's hearts, seldom say much about those treasures because people no longer want to go in search of them. We speak to them only of, we speak only to them of, let me say that again, we speak of them only to children. Later, we simply let life proceed in its own direction toward its own fate. But fortunately, but unfortunately, very few follow the path laid out before them, the path personal legend and I'm going to add here just just for clarity that in this book is the same thing as our God inspired aspirations and our divinely uh, divinely dreamt dreams most people see the world as a threatening place and because they do the world turns out indeed to be a threatening place 
So we, their hearts, speak more and more softly. We never stop speaking out, but we begin to hope that our words won't be heard because we don't want people to suffer because they don't follow their hearts. Did you hear that? We don't want people to suffer by not following their hearts. Why don't people's hearts tell them to continue to follow their dreams, the boy asked the alchemist. Because that's what makes a heart suffer most, and hearts don't like to suffer. From then on, the boy understood his heart. He asked it, please never stop speaking to me. He asked that when he wandered far from his dream, that his heart would press him and sound the alarm. The boy swore that every time he heard the alarm, he would heed its message. That night, he told all of this to the alchemist, and the alchemist understood that the boy's heart had returned to the soul of the world. What should I do now? The boy asked. That is where we'll leave our story for today. <laughs> oh, and we will pick it up right there. We'll pick it up right there next Sunday. But I want us to mine some gold that is in the story that we've heard so far. So last week, just to bridge the gap <coughs> from last week to this week, we talked about two spiritual tools that will help us reveal the bridge before us that takes us from the incubation to the manifestation of the dream. One of them was to cultivate the open moment. You remember this? Those of you who are here or listened online, uh, that we, we cultivate the open moment by just having a corner of our mind open to the possibility that what we think might be impossible could actually be possible. That's cultivating the open moment. That what we think might be impossible actually could be possible. And this is scriptural because it says in the Bible, with God, what? Good job. With God, all things are possible. So let's say that with a little more gusto now. Okay, come on. With God, all things are possible. Now let's take right now, because I love to make this practical and personal. I know every one of you has something that you are aspiring to. You have a dream. You have, I don't know where you are on the bridge, but you are walking across that bridge right now from incubation to manifestation. So you're walking, you're walking. I want you to get that in your mind right now. And let's just rephrase, with, the, with God all things are possible. And let's say, with God my dream is possible. With God my dream is possible. You want to add some oomph to that? Let's get in our power pose. Science has said this is the power pose right here. If you really want it, you stand up, but you don't have to do that. It's okay. But if you want it, you can. I'm, ju I'm just saying, if you really want it, here we go. With God my dream is possible. One more time. With God my dream is possible. Oh, yeah. Nice. So that's where we went last week. We also then looked at, what we already reflected on briefly, the idea to follow that inner guidance, to follow the inner voice. And we've renamed it with Reverend Sandy's beautiful help from her book, The Voice That Loves Me. That's our intuition. And I gave you a promise, and I stand on this promise, that that voice will never steer you wrong. Never. Never. And it is the voice that loves you. So that's where we went last week. Today we're going to add another spiritual tool to help us continue, because now we're mid-bridge <laughs> and now we're going to move on and continue on but here's what can happen there we are standing mid-bridge why aren't we moving forward why aren't we scurrying across that bridge just like Indiana Jones did to that Holy Grail he zipped across it why don't we do that sometimes he oh I'm loving it that you're actually answering me thank you I love that I love that that was a rhetorical question but you're ready to answer and I'm so excited about that <laughs> I believe that the reason we don't just continue on is that there is something in front of us that looks like an obstacle. Something in front of us that looks like a problem. Something in front of us that looks like a roadblock. Something in front of us that makes us go, ah, I can't do this. Does anybody relate to that? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So we, you, know, when you, you know of what I speak, right? So Reverend Sandy's tool in her book is this. <clears throat> Cultivate the idea that the problem is never the problem. <laughs> now wrap our head around that. The problem is never the problem. We've spoken on this a lot here. So I'm going to ask, if the problem is not the problem, then what is the problem? My thinking about it. It is my thinking. That's what I read in, in the Science of Mind textbook this morning. 
the thing that's in front of us that looks like the problem isn't the problem. It's the way we're perceiving it. It's the way we're looking at it. It's what we think about it that becomes the problem, that becomes the roadblock. But what if we had a different view of this thing that looks like the problem? What if we had a different perception of it? So here's just a little example. There's a uh, professor, a philosophy professor. He's taught this class, this college class, and it's now done, and it's the last class, and it's time for the exam, the final exam. So the professor walks in. He doesn't have any tests to hand out. He just walks into class, and he takes a chair, and he puts it on top of his desk. And he says, okay, students, using everything that you've learned this semester about philosophy, I want you to prove, this is your final exam, one question, I want you to prove that this chair does not exist. So with that, the students start writing fast and furiously, and the erasers are flying, and one kid writes 30 pages, and they take the full hour, and I mean, they're heated, and they're sweating, and they're nervous. And, huh. But one student, very calmly, writes for about 30 seconds, picks up his paper, walks up to the professor, hands it in, walks out. The other students are thinking, well, pfft, that kid's flunking this class. We, we, you know, we've got it. All right, it's over. Two weeks later, it's time for the grades to be posted, and everybody is aghast to look at the grades and to see that this kid who took 30 seconds is the only one who got an A. How did he do that? His answer was two words. What do you suppose it was? What chair? What chair? Problem? What problem? There isn't one there. It is, the only problem is the way we think about it. So I want to give you <clears throat> another story. Another story to help us look at, to be an example, to help us look at our problem in a different way. That thing that stands, we're there, we're on the bridge, and here this is. We're working our way to our dream, and here this thing is. And we think it's a problem. So I want to tell you another story. This isn't the alchemist. This is different. And it's perhaps a story you have heard one, two, three, ten. I don't know how many times. I heard it many, many times growing up in my Baptist church. But what I didn't hear was some subtleties about this story that make all the difference in the world and are what the, our teaching lesson for today. This story is, uh, happened uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's, wait, wait, sorry, wrong story. It did happen, however, a long time ago. The Philistines and the Israelites were at battle. And they were having a fierce and ferocious battle. And even though the Israelites were quite outsized, these Philistines were big, very big men, the Israelites were holding their own, and this battle is just, just going on and on and on and on. Well, one day... One of the Philistines, who happened to be big among the big guys, he was huge. He was huge. He would even say gigantic. He decides to throw out something to the Israelites. He says, Israelites, if one of you, if one of you soldiers will come fight me, and if you will beat me, then we will become your slaves. Now, of course, if I beat you, you all will become our slaves. But that's my offer. And twice a day, at dawn and at dusk, he would walk along the, the border of this, of this battle and he would throw out, kind of taunt the Israelites with his offer. Any one of you want to come fight me? Any one of you want to come fight me? We'll, we'll call this war over. Well, nobody jumped at the chance. <laughs> In fact, whenever he would stand there taunting, the, the Israelites would scurry. They would run away because they didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with this. They, nobody wanted to go do that. It, and it reminded me very much when I, in, a, uh, in a, my world a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I worked for a law firm and I had law students. Uh, we, it, was a, it was called the summer clerk program and law students would come work for the summer and then they would decide if they liked working for the firm and the firm would decide if they liked them and then we would make offers and they would accept it or they wouldn't. And my, part of my job was to distribute the, the um, um, projects that these students would work on. And they all had a bunch of projects. They were all loaded up. And then, of course, every day, more than once, like 
you know, two anniversaries a day, <laughs> more, more than once, uh, I, there would be a rush project that a lawyer would need somebody right now to work on this project. So I would get it, and I would need to go find the work to do it. I would go to the law library, because that's where they were all hanging out, and they very quickly learned that as soon as they saw me, they scattered. <laughs> I couldn't find them. They're like, where'd they go? I know they were in there when I walked in, and then they're gone. I think the Israelites did the same thing when they saw Goliath, right? <laughs> Right. And you know the story now, right? You've heard this story before, yes? Yes, you've heard the story. So that's what happened. They just scurried and scattered and run, ran away. So one day, Jesse, Jesse is a man who has four sons, and three of his elder, his three elder sons were soldiers in the war. And one of his sons, David, who was the sheep tender, he was the shepherd, his father said to him, I'm going to pack a, a lunch and some provisions, and I want you to take these to the front and take them to your brother. Oh, brothers. So he did. So off David is with a basket of goodies to take to his brothers. Well, he gets there about the time that it's, it's probably dusk and Goli there's Goliath making his taunting uh, offer. And all of these soldiers did what they did. They scattered. And so David scattered. When he, when they all, when Goliath was gone and they all started reconvening, he couldn't find his brothers. They scattered somewhere. So now he's looking for his brothers. And in the course of looking for his brothers, he learns a couple of important facts. One of them is that Goliath has been doing this, has been offering this challenge for 40 days. So let's pause here for just one second. Those of you who have been around here a little while, what does 40, the number 40, spiritually, metaphysically stand for? The time it takes for transformation. All the time it takes for transformation. I love it. I, did, I never heard this in my youth at how long it was. Forty days is how long Goliath was taunting the Israelites. <clears throat> all the time it took for transformation. All the time for there to be an opening, to be an expansion, to be a new understanding. Forty days. <clears throat> and then David hears that King Saul really wants this war to be over. He is really, really tired of it. He wants it over. And so he is making the pot sweeter for a, or he's like creating a very sweet pot for anybody who would be willing to take this challenge. They would get, number one, great riches. Okay, not bad. Number two, they would, they and the rest of their family for the rest of their lives would never again be taxed. Mm -hmm. Not a bad thing. But here's the real kicker. They, whoever fought Goliath and won, would get the hand of the beautiful princess in marriage. Oh, now that is a nice offer. Yep. David hears this offer. and <laughs> I, Bill likes the offer. I like it. <laughs> Bill likes the offer. <clears throat> so David hears this offer and he thinks to himself, hmm, that's pretty sweet. Maybe, just maybe, I would like to go for that. All of a sudden, he had a dream. This, here's an incubation, the seed of a dream. I would like riches. I would like not to ever be taxed, and I would really like to marry the beautiful princess. He has a dream. So he says to his brothers, who he has now found, I'm thinking I'm going to go for this. I think I'm going to do it. I'll just pause for a moment, and do you find yourself in this? Because th what do you suppose his brothers said? Who do you think you are? You are just a mere shepherd boy. You're a skinny little kid. You're not even a soldier. How in the world could you possibly fight this giant soldier? You are crazy. Any of you ever had somebody tell you that you were crazy to be following your dream? They're ridiculous. It couldn't happen. There's no way. Mm-hmm. Really important who you hang out with. I'm not saying dump your family and friends. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's really important who you share your dreams with Amen. and who you don't share your dreams with. So his brothers did not support him in any way, shape, or form. But he still had the dream. He still was thinking, hmm, riches, not bad, no taxes, good. Ooh, princess, yes. <laughs> I like... I like that idea a lot. And his vision, his dream started really playing in his mind. It started living in his mind. And he started thinking over and over again, wow, that would be cool. But there was a problem. There was kind of a big, tall, wide problem in front of him. His name was Goliath. What did David do? Did David focus on the problem? No. He did not. He saw it. 
Yeah, he's big. Consequences of losing, they're pretty severe. Oh, but the princess, oh, this is what he realized. And this is the subtlety that I never got when I heard this story before. What he realized was that the problem, the obstacle, was in fact the way. If it weren't for that obstacle, there would be no prize on the other side. The obstacle was the way. I've given a whole week, a month sermon on the obstacle is the way, but here it is again in front of us. We're building our dream. We're walking across the bridge. We're midway. We see an obstacle and we think, oh my gosh, I'm going I'm to turn around and walk away. I'm going to run back to the edge where it's safe. And sometimes we do that. But in the alchemist, the heart says, everyone has their treasure, but not everyone will go after it. Because we don't go after it because we see the obstacle. But the truth is that obstacle is there to create a greater way for us to get there. That's the subtlety of this story that is so brilliant and so profound. I never heard it in my, my growing up. So David says to the king, I want to do this. I want to do it. I think I can do it. I've got God with me. Totally. I mean, David was a very connected young man, very connected to spirit. He said, like, God with me, I can do this. And so the Saul's like, well, nobody else has stepped up, so let's give it a shot. He puts his armor, puts armor on David, who says, listening to his inner voice, no, 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 this armor isn't me. I can't even fit in it. It's no good. I don't want this armor to take it off. And they're all like, no, you have to wear it. No, I'm not wearing it. Following his inner voice. He took the armor off. He bent down. He picked up, we know this story now, right? Five smooth stones. And he put one of them in a slingshot. And, pew, 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 boom, and he got that giant right there. Right there. Took him down like that. I love... The story, the way of telling the story, this interpretation of this, but you, you read it all and it's all in the Bible. But this, this emphasis I heard for the first time as Reverend Sandy did, because we both are students of a wonderful soul in this world, Reverend Mary Mann and Morrissey. Mary Morrissey tells the story of David this way, but she also adds, and I love this. So what do you think when David was, you know, getting ready to let go of that uh, stone and he's looking at this giant, is he seeing the giant? Is he seeing that giant? Because if he's seeing that giant, he's nervous and he's scared and his shot's going to be off. He is not seeing. His mind is not here with the giant. His mind, you know where his mind is? Oh, yeah. No, um, his, his mind is in, he's in bed with the princess. That's what she says, right? That's where he is. He's, that's, he's got himself there already. And that is what fortified him <laughs> to be able to look through and past the obstacle and actually realize the obstacle was the way to his dream being made manifest. Everyone, as I said, already had the opportunity to do this, but none of them took it. I read from the alchemist, everyone on earth has a treasure that awaits him, the heart said, but we seldom say much about those treasures because people no longer want to go in search of them. Very few follow the path laid out for them, the path to their personal legends and to happiness. Most people see the world as a threatening place, and because they do, the world turns out indeed to be a threatening place. But not David. He didn't see it that way. And not you. And not you. You don't see it that way. I'm so glad of that. And if you were seeing it that way, today we're making a shift. Today we're applying this new spiritual tool to not see that obstacle as a threat, but in fact to see it as the way to get to that perfect place, that manifestation of your divinely inspired dream, that divinely given aspiration and hope that is in your heart. So my question is, my friends, are you ready to continue the journey? Yes. That well, I did want an answer to that one. Good. So I'm, ha I'm happy we got that. I'm happy that we got that. Thank you. Today we've had two shepherd boys, two shepherd boys, neither of whom had the skill, ability, strength, or anything else to manifest the dreams, both of whom did, because they dug deeply into their internal resources they listened to their inner guidance. They took the open moment. They cultivated the open moment awareness, which said this is actually possible. And they did not see a problem as an obstacle, but instead focused on the answer, focused on the goal. I remember I said when I started this morning and the last line I read from the alchemist was the boy said, what should I do now? And I said, I'll save that for next week. 
I will save that for next week, but I'll just give you a little hint. What should I do now? Continue the journey. Let's close our eyes. Because in this moment, we recognize, as it is said in The Alchemist, that every step of the journey to the dream is an encounter with God. Every step of the journey to the dream is an encounter with God. And so it is in this moment that we take a deeper dive into that encounter with God. Connecting with the dream that has been planted there by the divine in our hearts. Connecting more deeply, diving in more fully to the steps on the path. Knowing that every step is guided, every step along the way we are protected, every moment is inspired, and every encounter is a second encounter with the divine. So in this sweet space, right here and right now, our souls get ready to take a dive, a deep dive into source, into God, into life, into love, and into the fruition and complete bringing forth into tangible human form our deepest dreams. Thank you, thank you, Spirit, for this absolute occurrence. Thank you for this ability to continue the journey. Thank you for the gift of the journey. Because it's all God, and so it's all good. Knowing that that is so, I simply release this prayer, knowing that it is done. And so together we say, and so it is. Get ready. I'm down.